When talking about Philippine history, people usually talk about the history after the arrival of the Spanish in 1521. Sometimes there will be others that will discuss the pre-colonial history of the Philippines, the various kingdoms or sultanates that appeared throughout the islands. However, I would like to go back even further than that. I would like to venture into what is called prehistory. This is the period before any surviving recorded history in the islands. This likely isn't because nothing was written during that time, but due to the fact nothing from that time survived to be recorded by us today. For example, one of the oldest quote-unquote records that we have is the Laguna Copper Plate inscription. For other records, surely were written, but they did not survive to us in the present. In another video, I discussed the first peoples to arrive in the Philippines, but we never really talked about what we know about them. Experts can only theorize who were the first people that came here and how, but there are no records that survive from their time. In the last video, the basis of these studies were genetics, but in this one, we will primarily look at archaeological remains. There are artifacts that survive from that time, and these can tell us a lot about the life of the people living in the Philippines back then. Specifically, I want to talk about the Sloan Age in the Philippines. In this video, I will be primarily using Peter Bellwood's book, First Islanders, which is a great source for prehistoric island Southeast Asia. The Stone Age is divided into two parts, the Paleolithic, or Early Stone Age, and the Neolithic, or the Late Stone Age. These ages are not constant for all over the world, but they are only markers which signal a level of technological development of certain cultures, and thus it is not the same everywhere. The Paleolithic was the first half of the Stone Age. It had already started when the first modern humans arrived in the Philippine archipelago around 50,000 years ago. This period was characterized by the continuous change of the global environmental conditions. The people of this period also adopted the hunter-gatherer lifestyle to survive and thrive. They would hunt for wild animals and would gather wild fruits to be eaten. Most interesting, at least for me, was the utilization of stone tools by humans. Just to be clear here, when I say tools, don't think of the tools that we use today. These tools were pretty basic and unrefined. However, they did give the humans an advantage and what they needed to do to get whatever job they needed done. We have a few archaeological findings from this period, but significant sites include the Tabon Cave, the Duyum Cave, the Iria Cave, and the Sagung Caves in Palawan, and the sites in the Cagayan Valley in northern Luzon. So far, archaeologists have found tools made of stone or sometimes shells. They did this by striking a big solid stone core with another stone. This process would gradually remove parts of the stone core or shell until it had a sharpened edge. These sharpened tools could then be used as a knife to skin or cut animals, or as an axe to split or cut wood. Another familiar practice that we know occurred during this time was the burial of their dead. After the Paleolithic period, there was the Neolithic period, which is characterized by the invention of agriculture and the domestication of animals. Also associated with the period was the development of pottery and the advancement of tool making. In the Philippines, the Neolithic period is said to have lasted, though sources may vary, from 4200 years ago or 2200 BC to 2500 years ago or 500 BC. To make sense of the Neolithic period in the Philippines, we must first track down its origins in central China. After the warming and wetting of the earth during the last ice age, wild plants multiplied in number alongside the wild animals that fed on them. One of the hotspots of this wild plant boom was in central China, specifically between the basins of the Yellow and Yangtze rivers. It was here that wild plants of the foxtail and common mill, and more importantly for us, rice, or Oryza sativa, was first domesticated. Neolithic farmers in what is now China, alongside those in the Middle East, Mesoamerica, and the Andes independently developed agriculture. Previously, they had gathered wild plants to eat, but they figured out that some of these wild plants had better qualities than others. Some plants had bigger and more grains, or they ripened quickly and evenly, or they tasted better, had a better color, or any other trait they wanted. These early farmers picked out these plants and replanted them, hoping to have more of the plants with great qualities. They also did these with wild animals, selecting docile and fertile animals to breed. This was the start of the process of domestication. In the case of rice, we can trace back its steady progress in China.
Over the course of thousands of years, the archaeological record struck the steady process of the domestication of rice in China from its wild form in 7000 BC to its domesticated form in 4000 BC. The domestication of plants and animals gave the Neolithic humans the surplus they needed to support many more people compared to hunting and gathering. This caused a population boom in central China, with estimates of the population multiplying by 10 or even 50 times. The population boom was dependent on the ever-increasing number of domesticated plants such as bananas, sugar canes, and taro, and domesticated animals such as pigs and water buffalo. It was also during this time that pottery developed with various pieces of pottery used to contain food or other valuables. It could also have been used to cook food over a fire. Eventually, these practices would spread beyond central China. As the Neolithic culture moved south, it was rice that would be used as a main crop instead of millet, because it was rice that was more suitable for the warmer and wetter weather of the south. The Neolithic culture would eventually reach the southern Chinese coast at between 4000 to 3500 BC. It would reach Taiwan at around 3500 BC. In here, many archaeological finds were found concerning the Neolithic period. This included more complex forms of earthenware pottery and large burial jars for their dead. There was also another site that contained the foundations for over 50 houses and 1500 burials dated from around 1500 to 800 BC. The Neolithic culture first reached the Batanes Islands in northern Philippines at around 2200 BC. This would mark the start of the Neolithic period, which lasted from 2200 BC to around 500 BC, when metals such as iron and copper first made their appearance. Archaeological findings here give us a glimpse of how the early Austronesian migrants to the Philippines lived. There we see remains of tools like stone adzes. Imagine an axe, but the blade is perpendicular to the handle. They would have used this tool to carve wood in order to make basic furniture or even houses. But there were other uses for wood. Bark beaters were also found, which were tools to use to pound tree barks into thin fabric sheets that can be used as clothes. Alongside those, stone spindle whorls were also uncovered. These tools aided in converting materials into yarn. These yarns had many applications. One of these was making rope to be used as fishing nets. We know this because we have found stone sinkers, which were tied at the ends of nets to help them sink and catch fish or other sea animals. The shells of some sea animals were then made into bracelets. Otherwise, any food they had could then be stored in earthenware pottery. Speaking of those, the type of pottery found there was similar to those discovered in Taiwan. They are described as red slip and cord bark. But what does that mean? To explain it simply, when Neolithic humans made earthenware pottery, they would get some clay and mold them into the rough shape of the pot that they want. As the clay was still soft, they could pinch and mold them with their hands but they would use tools to be more precise. One way they did this was with an anvil and a paddle. With one hand, they would hold an anvil stone and place it on the inside of the clay mold, and with the other hand, they would use the paddle to pound the outside of the mold into the desired thinness. A small rope or cord was wrapped around the paddle in order for the clay to not stick to it. This resulted in cord marks on the outside of the pottery, which remained when it was eventually dried out and hardened. The red slip, on the other hand, just meant that the pottery was given a layer of slip. A paint-like mix made of water and clay to give it an additional layer of protection or just for decoration. These spots would then be used to hold grain or other food, or they could have used it to cook food over a fire. There was a wealth of Neolithic findings in Batanes, however it is theorized that the Neolithic populations that arrived in Batanes moved quickly to mainland Luzon to the more fertile landscapes of the Cagayan Valley. The Neolithic period in the Cagayan Valley can be divided into two phases. The first phase was from 2200 to 1500 BC. What's curious about this time was the plains that were necessary for rice farming did not exist yet due to water levels being 2 meters or 6.5 feet higher than they are today. Because of this, it was theorized that when Neolithic humans arrived, rice wasn't the preferred crop but tuber plants such as siam and taro. After 1500 BC, the wetland plains that were needed for the water-reliant crops appeared, which in turn caused rice to become a viable crop that was used by the inhabitants of the Cagayan Valley. Besides plants, animals were also domesticated, with evidence of domesticated pigs in a settlement named Nagsabaran at around 2000 BC. 
There is also evidence of dogs and possibly bovines such as water buffalo in Nagsabaran but they only appeared at around 500 BC at the end of the Stone Age. With domestication and agriculture established, the Neolithic peoples now had a steady food supply that allowed them to stay in one place. This is evidenced by the many Neolithic settlements discovered in the Cagayan Valley. One kind of settlement, like Nagsabaran, was a village of stilt houses, also known as pile dwellings, that was located near the marshland near the river level. Another kind of settlement, like Magapit, was made on top of a low limestone hill overlooking the river. In some of these sites, there are clear connections with Neolithic Taiwan, as artifacts such as red slip pottery similar to those in Taiwan and Batanes were found. Alongside those were clay pendants, spindle whorls, jade objects, and bark cloth beaters. Bellwood points out in his book that aside from sites in the Batanes Islands and the Cagayan Valley, there is drastically less information that can be recovered about the Neolithic in the rest of the Philippines. This is most likely due to the limited resources available to Philippine archaeologists. Neolithic sites are usually in steep locations and buried deep within the earth. A notable artifact from outside of northern Luzon is the Manangul jar found in Palawan. Dated at around 890 to 710 BC, it is believed to be a burial jar and shows the great quality of Philippine pottery during that time. The top of the jar shows two figures in a boat, demonstrating ancient humans' ability to sail in the Philippines. Hopefully, more discoveries will be made in the future, but funding for archaeology programs remains so small that it is hard to keep watch during deep construction when discovery is most likely. The sites in the Cagayan Valley were an exception because they were topped with shell mounts. These were possible because the lower Cagayan River is rich in shellfish. This made them easy to identify as possible archaeological sites. One day, I hope more resources will be invested in the archaeological programs of the Philippines. We do not have the luxury of written records being passed down to us through thousands of years, and discovering what our ancestors left behind is our best chance to know about them as they existed before colonization. It was during the Stone Age that people in the Philippines started to extensively change their environment to their benefit. No longer were they completely subject to the whims of nature, but now they could harness it for their own ends. Humanity has transformed the face of the earth, but now it is up to us in the present if that was ultimately for the better or for the worse.